Hi, Stephen King here. I'm going to read you the first chapter of Gwendy's Final Task, which is very short, wicked short, we say up in Maine. Um, the intro will probably be longer <laughs> than the chapter. Um, your first question is probably going to be, can I read this book without having read the first two in the trilogy? And the answer is absolutely. All you need to know is that when Gwendy Peterson was 12 years old, she was given a dangerous box to care for, one that could destroy the whole world. Now she's in her 60s, suffering an incurable disease, and the button box is turned up in her life again. Dangerous entities would like to get the button box. Gwendy's mission, get rid of it once and for all before that can happen. So this is the first chapter of Gwendy's Final Task. It's a beautiful April day in Playa Linda, Florida, not far from Cape Canaveral. This is the year of our Lord, 2026, and only a few people in the crowd standing on the east side of Max Heck Back Brook are wearing masks. Most of those are old people who got into the habit and find it hard to break. The coronavirus is still around like a party guest who won't go home. And while many fear it may mutate again and render the vaccines useless, for now, it's been fought to a draw. Some members of the crowd, again, it's mostly the oldies, the ones whose eyesight isn't as good as it used to be, are using binoculars, but most are not. The craft standing on the Playa Linda launch pad is the biggest manned rocket ever to lift off from Mother Earth. With a fully loaded mass of 4.57 million pounds, it has every right to be called the Eagle 19 Heavy. A fog of vapor obscures the last 50 of its 400 foot height, but even those with fading vision can read the three letters running down the spacecraft's side. Tet, and those with even fair hearing can pick up the applause when it begins. One man, old enough to remember hearing Neil Armstrong's crackling voice telling the world that the eagle has landed, turns to his wife with tears in his eyes and goosebumps on his tanned, scrawny arms. The old man is Douglas Dusty Brigham. His wife is Sheila Brigham. They retired to the town of Destin 10 years ago but they are originally from Castle Rock, Maine. Sheila, in fact, was once the dispatcher in the sheriff's office. From the Tet Corporation's launch facility, a mile and a half away, the applause continues. To Dusty and Sheila, it sounds thin, but it must be much louder across the creek because herons arise from their morning's resting places in lacy white clouds. They're on their way, Dusty tells his wife of 52 years, God bless our girl, Sheila says, and crosses herself. God bless our Gwendy Peterson. That's chapter one. For chapter two, you can look on YouTube and find Rich Chismar, my collaborator, who reads that one. Thanks a lot. Actually, Steve, I'm right here, ready to read chapter two. So uh, let's get right to it. Eight men and two women walk in a line along the right side of the Tech Control Center. They're protected by a plexiglass wall because they've been in quarantine for the last 12 days. The techs rise from behind their computers and applaud. That much is tradition, but today there's also cheering. There will be more applause and cheers from the 1,500 Tet employees. The patches on their shirts, jackets, and coveralls identify them as the Tet rocket jockeys outside. Any manned space mission is an event, but this one is extra special. Second from the end of the line is a woman with her long hair, now gray, tied back in a ponytail that's mostly hidden beneath the high collar of her pressure suit. Her face is unwrinkled and still beautiful, although there are fine lines around her eyes and at the corners of her mouth. Her name is Gwendy Peterson. She's 64, and in less than an hour, she will be the first sitting U.S. Senator to ride a rocket to the new MF-1 space station. There are cynics among Gwendy's political peers who like to say MF stands for a certain incestuous sex act, but it actually stands, stands for many flags. The crew are carrying their helmets for the time being, so nine of them have a free hand to wave, acknowledging the cheers. Gwendy, technically a crew member, can't wave unless she wants to wave the small white box in her other hand, and she doesn't want to do that. 
Instead of waving, she calls, we love you and thank you. This is one more step to the stars. The cheers and applause redouble. Someone yells, Gwendy for president. A few others take up the call, but not that many. She's popular, but not that popular, especially not in Florida, which went red again in the last general election. The crew leaves the building and climbs into the three-car tram that will take them to Eagle Heavy. Gwendy has to crane her neck all the way to the reinforced collar of her suit to see the top of the rocket. Am I really going up in that, she asks herself, and not for the first time. In the seat next to her, the team's tall, sandy-haired biologist leans for toward her. He speaks in a low murmur. There's still time to back out. No one would think the worse of you. Gwendy laughs. It comes out nervy and too shrill. If you believe that, you must also believe in Santa Claus and the Tooth Fairy. Fair enough, he says, but never mind what people would think. If you have any idea, any at all, that you're going to freak out and start yelling, wait, stop, I've changed my mind, when the engines light up, then call it off now. Because once those engines go, there's no turning around and no one needs a panicked politician on board, or a panicky billionaire for that matter. He looks to the car ahead of them where a man is bending the ear of the ops commander. In his white pressure suit, the man bears a resemblance to the Pillsbury Doughboy. The three-car tram starts to roll. Men and women in coveralls applaud them on their way. Wendy puts the white case down and holds it firmly between her feet. Now she can wave. I'll be fine. She's not entirely sure of that, but tells herself she has to be. Has to. Because of the white case. Stamped in raised red letters on both sides are the words classified material. How about you? The bio guy smiles and Wendy realizes that she can't remember his name. He's been her training partner for the last four weeks. Only minutes ago, they back-checked each other's suits before leaving the holding area, but she can't remember his name. This is NG, as her late mother would have said. Not good. I'll be fine. This will be my third trip, and when the rocket starts to climb and I feel the G-force pressing down? Speaking just for myself, it's the best orgasm a boy ever had. Thank you for sharing, Gwendy says. I'll be sure to put that in my first dispatch to the down below. It's what they call Earth, the down below. She remembers that, but what's BioBoy's damn name? In the pocket of her jumper, she's got a notebook with all sorts of info in it, not to mention a very special bookmark. The names of all the crew members are in there, but no way can she get at the notebook now, and even if she could, it might, almost certainly would, raise suspicions. Gwendy falls back on the technique Dr. Ambrose gave her. It doesn't always work, but this time it does. The man next to her is tall, square-jawed, blue-eyed, and has a tumble of sandy hair. The women think he's hot. What's hot? Fire's hot. If you touch it, you might get a... Burn. That's his name. Burn Stapleton. Professor Burn Stapleton, who also happens to be Major Burn Stapleton. Retired. Please don't, Burn says. She's pretty sure he's talking about his orgasm metaphor. There's nothing wrong with her short-term memory, at least not so far. Well, not too wrong. I was joking, Gwendy says, and pats his gloved hand with her own. And stop worrying, Byrne. I'll be fine. She tells herself again that she must be. She doesn't want to let down her constituents. And today, that's all of America and most of the world. But that's minor compared to the locked white box between her boots. She can't let it down. Because there's a box inside the box, made not of high-impact steel, but of mahogany. It's a foot wide, a bit more than that in length, and about seven inches deep. There are buttons on top and levers so small you have to pull them with your pinky finger on each side. They have just one paying customer on this flight to the MF, and it's not Gwendy. She has an actual job, not much of one, mostly just recording data on her iPad and sending it back to tech control, but it's not entirely a cover for her real business in the up above. She's a climate monitor. Her call designation is Weather Girl, and some of the crew jokingly refers to her as Temptus Storm, the name of a long-ago ecdysiast. What is that, she asked herself. I should know. Because she doesn't, she resorts to Dr. Ambrose's technique again. The word she's looking for is like paint, isn't it? No, not paint. Before you paint, you have to get rid of all the old paint. You have to strip, she murmurs. What, Burn asks? He's been distracted by a bunch of applauding men standing beside one of the emergency trucks, which, please God, won't have to roll on this fine day. Nothing, she says, thinking an ecdysiast an ecdysiast is a stripper. It's always a relief when the missing words come. She knows that all too soon they won't. She doesn't like that, is in fact terrified of it, but that's the future. Right now, she just has to get through today. Once she's up there, where the air is not just rare, but non-existent, they can't just send her home if they discover what's wrong with her, can they? But they could screw up her mission if they found out. And there's something else, something that would be even worse. Gwendy doesn't want to even think about it, but can't help herself. What if she forgets the real reason she's up there? 
The real reason is the box inside the box. It sounds melodramatic, but Gwendy Peterson knows it's true. The fate of the world depends on what's inside that box.